It is once again that time of year for me to do a video on LGBT history and watch as a bunch of people get upset that I use a history channel to talk about history. But just like my video from last year's Pride Month on how Frederick the Great was very gay, I don't want to just point out an identity of someone, but to talk about how differently it meant at that time, how it impacted their lives, and how history's interpretations have changed over time. The subject of this video isn't as impactful onto history directly as Frederick the Great, but is nevertheless important in showing how, while terms and understanding of labels may change, core ideas around LGBT identities have always existed. This video is about a person named Public Universal Friend. The Friend's story is basically being a non-binary individual. However, saying this brings up a lot of questions. Transgender, or even other similar outdated terms like transsexual or transvestite, those were all coined as words in the 20th century. So there is simply no way that someone like the Public Universal Friend called themselves trans. But when you look at how the Public Universal Friend expressed and conducted themselves, you can realize why the Public Universal Friend can retroactively be seen as trans and or non-binary. When it comes to labels, labels can be useful or harmful. You're taking characteristics and boxing them together. People are complicated, which is why not every label works for everyone. When society evolves, labels change. If Public Universal Friend was taken out of their time and placed in the modern day, the terms trans and non-binary would make sense. It works with our current understanding of the world. Alternatively, you take a modern homosexual person and put them in Rome, no Roman would quite have a concept of what homosexual means, even though there were lots of gay people and gay relationships in Rome. Their society just viewed sexuality differently. So when taking a person from the past and giving them the modern label, sure, it can be problematic when you're assuming. Because things are complicated, right? But this isn't an assumption. Just like with Frederick the Great's male lovers, erotic poems, and palace temple devoted to gay relationships from Greek mythology, Public Universal Friend's non-binary self is very obvious. So obvious that the friend said so themselves in the language of the time. So then this brings up a question on how to treat the friend when discussing their life. The Public Universal Friend didn't call themselves trans, and due to the time period, simply wouldn't have the same concerns and customs of the trans people of today. However, the friend did have preference in being addressed. They did explicitly reject gendered pronouns, and wanted to be addressed as Public Universal Friend, The Friend, P-U-F, or other similar variations. So using the friend, and occasionally they, is going to be what I'm going for in this video. I also consulted some transgender friends of mine on how to handle the friend's early life and birth name. This is a biography of the friend's life, but dead naming is still just extremely rude and disrespectful for most trans people, so the last thing I want to do is be rude and disrespectful. The general consensus I got was that mentioning the Public Universal Friend's original name is fine for educational purposes when discussing their life pre-transition as long as I'm actively referring to them with their preferred name and pronouns. They are Public Universal Friend, but used to be referred to as blank. That also seems to be how Wikipedia handles topics like this too, and it makes sense when you think about it. Saying somebody used to be called something isn't the same as me refusing to call somebody by their preferred name and disrespecting them. And unlike most trans people, the Public Universal Friend viewed their former identity in a very different and unique way, and I'll explain that later in the video. But regardless, that's how I'm going to handle things when talking about the Public Universal Friend's life. Now that we've gotten this introductory spiel out of the way, we can learn more about Public Universal Friend. But first... A word from this video sponsor, Ridge Wallet. Ridge is a company that makes wonderful high quality products most famously known for their metal wallets. You can fit all of your cards between these two metal plates and they'll be kept securely and fit nicely in your pocket, lasting much longer than an old fashioned leather wallet. I've had mine for years because I genuinely enjoy their design and find their wallets very convenient to use. With Father's Day coming up, Ridge is having everything 15% off on their site. So you could get a wallet as a Father's Day gift if you use the code EMPEROR with the link below. Or, you know what? 
Gender roles are stupid. Buy one for your mom or your sister if you want. The wallets are going to be wonderful no matter who you buy them for. These are just good wallets. So please, get a wallet, take advantage of this sale. And thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring this video. The person who would be known as Public Universal Friend was born on November 29th, 1752 in the British colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Yeah, I know, the full name's a mouthful. They were the offspring of Jeremiah and Amy Wilkinson, who saw their child as a daughter and gave them the name of Jemima, named after the biblical figure Job's daughter. Their environment growing up was that of the Society of Friends, more commonly known as the Quakers. The Quakers were a type of Protestant Christian known for their pacifism, anti-slavery views, and dressing plainly, meaning like the clothing Amish would wear. Based on what we know of their childhood, Jemima was athletic and had a good memory, especially with biblical verses. There was apparently a brief time where Jemima stopped attending Quaker services and tried attending New Light Baptist services, and this caused them to be disowned by their parents, and they didn't end up finding a new home among the New Light Baptists either, so in a way, they felt spiritually homeless. The American Revolution starting up around this time didn't really help with the stress either, but then the first death occurred. Sometime in October of 1776, Jemima was sick with a horrible fever and near death. At the time, it was custom for doctors to visit a home when death was believed to be imminent, so they could be present to declare the death, its time, cause, and so on. Then the part which happens next is disputed. According to the doctor and family who was present, Jemima was near death, but never declared dead. Some rumors spread around that they were declared medically dead by the standards of the time, but quote-unquote came back. Either way, death was avoided as far as the doctor was concerned. But the public universal friend, however, believed Jemima died. And this is where we get into the fun twist. Remember how I said the public universal friend viewed their pre-transition identity differently? That's because they believed themselves to be distinct from Jemima altogether. According to Public Universal Friend, Jemima died from the fever and ascended to heaven, but God decided to intervene and put a genderless spirit into the body to take Jemima's place. They declared themselves as the Public Universal Friend. But where does that name come from? Some theorize it derives from the Quaker custom of calling themselves public friends when on missions. So if the friend is on a mission from God, then it makes sense to emphasize they're a universal friend, I suppose. Either way, they refused their original given name, and if someone insisted on using it, the friend would chastise them. After all, from their point of view, you silly people, Jemima died. I have ascended. I am immortal. The friend also said that they were neither male nor female. Naturally, people at the time and early historians after their death refused to acknowledge this for various reasons, but nevertheless, that was their new identity. If someone asked if they were male or female, the friend would respond by quoting the verse from Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. In terms of conducting their aesthetic, the friend preferred androgyny, wearing androgynous outfits, basically just black clerical robes. The friend also rejected several former customs they followed when viewed as female. For example, the friend no longer wore hair caps indoors like Quaker women did at the time. Witnesses to the friend when speaking claimed that the friend varied their masculine versus feminine tones of their voice. The public universal friend, believing they were on a divine mission, went on a preaching tour in the northern parts of the United States. Notably, the friend preached about a few things. The friend disagreed with the notion of predestination, believing free will meant anyone could make the choice to be saved. The friend believed that slavery was immoral. Notably, this made the friend very popular with African Americans at the time, for obvious reasons. Love and peace is good. Yeah, I know, that does fit with the traditional Christian theology in general, but this was a common topic. Notably, the friend gave a sermon on such a matter while the U.S. and Iroquois were working on the Peace Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794, which was warmly received. The friend preferred sexual and marital abstinence, believing it was the best choice. However, the friend did say that marriage and sex were permissible, just not for them. Just not something that they were going to encourage or plan to do. Now look. I'm not going to say that this means the friend was Arrow Ace, but I'm not going to stop people from claiming that either. 
The Friends sermons were popular enough to gather large crowds, including Native Americans. Eventually, people became full-time followers, forming a congregation and calling themselves the Universal Friends. This made them the oldest known religious congregation formed in the United States as a country. The Friend one time claimed that a sign from Revelations would occur around April of 1780. As it so happened in May of 1780, a weather phenomenon occurred over parts of New England called New England's Dark Day. The afternoon sky became dark enough to require candles. Many followers of the Friend interpreted this as a vindicated prophecy. Naturally, whether it was the gender stuff or the prophecy stuff, the Friend had their detractors as well. Aside from accusations of being a false prophet, it became common for false rumors to be spread, such as the Friend being a temptress, a thief, a hoarder of money. This was not true, as the Friend did not own permanent personal possessions. Notably, when the friend needed something, they would hold something in common with someone else. One day, when crafting a document of such a deal over a dwelling, the preacher refused to allow the friend to sign under their full name, so the preacher simply marked an X in defiance. A letter X was typically used in place of signatures for a person when they couldn't read, and so this story caused some detractors of the friend to spread rumors that they were illiterate. This seemed to match the stories of the friend always preaching without a Bible, which is why it ended up taking hold, but followers simply stated the friend had masterful memory and simply didn't need it most of the time. Notably, publications of the friend's sermons focused more on the friend's weird, non-binary nature more than the content, partially because their content wasn't too different from Quaker theology anyway. Whatever the case, the friend did not always have a friendly environment. In the 1780s, the Universal Friends wanted to establish their own settlement in modern-day western New York. They ended up finding a spot and calling it Jerusalem. For reasons that are too complicated to fully explain, there were disputes over this land and the legitimacy of such a settlement. It also didn't help that there were people who didn't like the Friend and wanted them gone. Some people also wanted to take the land from them to make a lot of money. Eventually, in 1799, the Friend's detractors had enough of them and tried to get the Friend arrested for blasphemy. When an officer was sent to apprehend them, the Friend managed to escape them on horseback. When a group of men tried to seize the Friend at their dwelling, some female followers came out and tore the clothes off the men and they went home feeling embarrassed. When yet another group of men tried to kidnap the Friend, they happened to find a doctor at their side claiming the Friend was too sick to be moved so they reached an agreement where the friend would go to court over this supposed blasphemy in the summer of 1800 when hopefully they would feel better. In the summer of 1800, the friend did in fact go to court, but was acquitted. Sadly though, the doctor was a sign for things to come as the friend's health began to decline. Eventually, the friend gave a final sermon at the funeral of their sister named Patience in 1819. On July 1st, 1819, at 2.25, I could not find if that was a.m. or p.m., the friend passed away. In accordance with their wishes, they simply replaced a full funeral with a normal sermon and discussion. Then, after four days of being on display, the friend's body was buried in an unmarked grave. While the Society of Universal Friends lived on after the friend's death, early historians were not kind to them. Notably, an attempt at a biography by David Hudson, written in 1821, just two years after the friend's death, was particularly hostile. Aside from treating the friend as a woman the entire time, the biography had a very negative slant on the friend's life. Hudson claimed the friend was mean, bossy, manipulative, and supposedly would forcibly exile critical followers, taking their property as punishment and forcing them to divorce even if necessary. Those particular accusations in the book didn't have any substantial evidence, and people who knew the friend both as followers and non-followers at the time disputed those statements. But despite this, the book was popular enough to where many took this flawed biography as a definitive work, so much so that the work was used in court cases involving land owned by the society in an attempt to persuade judges against their favor. The Society of Friends declined from both the high numbers of abstinent followers and the bad press, eventually going extinct right around before the Civil War. Later historians had more positive views, but still misunderstood the friend as female, believing that the friend was rather avoiding female roles to put themselves as an equal to men. 
you know, girl power, I guess. Which, to be fair, was not an uncommon story in history. You have some historical figures like Hatshepsut or Nzinga who took male roles and preferred to be treated like men because their societies at the time used men for roles of power and respect, and they wanted the respect themselves. So when you don't understand the concept of being trans or non-binary, it's the interpretation that made the most sense at the time. Of course, you would also think that, like, they would look at their preferences and, like, believe them, but eh, what do I know? Could you imagine if, like, historians were this picky over people with nicknames? Hello, I'm Jimmy Carter. You disgusting, deceitful liar! Your name is James! Well, but my friends call me- No, enough of your lies! Be gone! But I want to be- Silence, James! In modern times where concepts of being transgender or non-binary are more well understood, modern historians have since made the connection. I find the most interesting interpretation of Public Universal Friend to be from Michael Bronsky, who across their works have stated that the Public Universal Friend isn't trans based on the standards and vocabulary of the time, but are nevertheless an example of someone in the realm of transness. Yet Michael Bronsky agrees that The Friend is one of America's earliest examples of someone with a non-binary identity regardless. Another LGBT historian, Scott Larson, wrote that The Friend is a chapter in trans history before transgender. Remember, labels are specific and chained to the time that they were used, evolving as understanding changes. But the core ideas are always there throughout history. Regardless of whether the friend can be considered quote-unquote truly transgender or not, they nevertheless found themselves with a non-binary identity and used it to define themselves, and they should deserve the respect for that all the same. I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll see you guys next time.